hit refresh. There we go. Oh, golly. Okay, look at that. So, am I in frame when? Everything is new with the new, uh, oh wait, no, not that picture. Hold on. Look, can you look at that? Okay. Um, What'd they have to do? I don't know. We're going to find out. I mean, the picture looks great. Let's see. Well, oh, you there you are. There's a delay. Oh, okay. There is a delay. Nancy warned me about that. Oh, okay. Oh. So what we got to do, I don't know how to find the comments and shit. Well, what we got to do? Get refresh. <laughs> There's Zach. Okay. Oh, my gosh. So my sister warned me about the delay. Oh, we got to silence that. Oh, my gosh. My sister warned me about a delay. Oh, my gosh. My sister warned me about a delay. Okay, so Nancy warned me about the delay, and we just experienced it, so bear with me. This is a whole new kitchen and a whole new setup, and I'm not really sure how things are going to go in this new space, so we're all going to do this together. Lynn is my handy-dandy assistant today, since my normal assistant is at the O'Hare Airport on his way home. Um, you're going to have to let me know. When Nancy logs in, Zach, I saw you in there. Thanks for Debbie, tuning in. Debbie's on. Which Debbie? Uh, Papola. Yes. Hi, Deb. Um, but yes, we are aware of the delay. My sister told me that I'm supposed to slow down because of that. I'm waiting for her to join in. And once she does, we're going to start cooking because this is all about teaching Nancy to cook long distance. And for those of you that this is your first time, uh, we started doing this during quarantine, during shutdown, so that Nancy could learn how to make... Tina. Hi, Tina. Um, Nancy could learn how to make something, because she's not a great cook, and she wants to be a better cook. And I think we've done that. She has mastered a couple of really good skills. I also want to let you know that this is my real house. This is my real kitchen. I have real dogs, and they may or may not bark during the whole thing, and I got a brand new puppy who is, if you follow me on Instagram, seriously freaking cute. If you're not following me on Instagram, I don't know why, because that's where I post all my food pictures and my dog pictures. And uh, it's good for spooning on YouTube, on, I don't do Twitter, Instagram, and here on Facebook. So one of the things I want to let you know is normally a smart person like me would happily post live direct from YouTube, only I don't have enough subscribers. So take a moment, go and subscribe to my YouTube channel, and that way I can cut out the middleman of Facebook and the delay. Because I get a delay because it's through Facebook Live. So, um, Is Nancy there yet? So she's the problem. So <laughs> the person who I'm trying to teach isn't on the call, and she's a problem. Okay. So, for those of you that have been following along, this is my new kitchen. Um, that's my sister calling me. Because I have to film this with my phone rather than my computer, you're getting everything, and I'm apologizing in advance for that. So Nancy says that she's on. We're going to go ahead and get started. So for those of you who've not seen my new kitchen, um, my old one was huge. This one is much more compact, and uh, I'm loving the black and white in the old Vegas uh, downtown area. So Nancy just said I'm on. Oh, I know. She just said it on the phone. Okay. So... Pasta glutinesca is a very old Italian dish, 
I, I don't know if this story is true, but rumor has it that years ago in Italy, the ladies of the evening or the working girls or the putas, the whores, were not allowed to shop in the grocery store on certain days of the week. So in order for them to feed themselves, they had to make do with shelf stable items instead of fresh produce or fresh meat. And you know, there wasn't a lot of refrigeration back then. So a lot of canned stuff got used. So literally everything that goes into this dish is shelf stable. You've got your garlic that can be stored at room temperature. You've got your onions that can be and should be stored at room temperature. Dry pasta, canned tomatoes, everything. And this is also infinitely riffable. So if you don't like anchovies or if you're a vegetarian, you can leave them out. It'll just change the flavor a little bit. You don't have this kind of olive, use that kind of olive. You don't have that shape of pasta, use a different shape of pasta. I'm using diced tomatoes today. But if you all you have is crushed, use that. It doesn't matter. This is a completely riffable recipe, and it is intended for you to be able to use whatever's in your pantry. The other thing to keep in mind is Nancy brought it up to me. She can't eat just pasta. She's got to have some sort of protein with it. So you can throw in leftover chicken from a rotisserie chicken. You can saute some shrimp on the side. You can pre-cook sausages and slice them up and throw them in. You can have a grilled chicken breast on the side or a piece of steak on the side. It's entirely up to you. Lynn and I will be eating this like as is. So first thing I want you to do is start your pot of water. It should be roughly six quarts of water and we're gonna make it as salty as the ocean because if you have been following along, you know that the only time you actually get to season the pasta itself is when it's in the water. So we're gonna add a ton of salt to the water, about a quarter cup for six quarts of water. Now, normally it says, oh, boil it in eight quarts. Well, we want the starchy water for later. So six quarts is plenty. And we are going to, I don't know where I put my, um, it's oh, it's Alyssa Ann oh, it's says the floor is stunning. Oh, thank you. And Nancy said, Walt made some chicken breasts we're going to throw in. Terrific. See, Nancy, you're learning to adapt on your own. So I'm going to put in a ton of salt, and we're going to get let the water get to boil. Okay, the next thing I want you to do is I want you to drain your capers. So I like to use a little tiny colander. Capers um, generally come in brine in a jar, and they are actually flower buds from a specific bush. Don't ask me which one, I don't know. If you're capers are packed in salt and they do come that way sometimes I want you to rinse them really well and get as much of the salt off as possible because everything that's going in this dish is pretty much canned and so there's a little bit of salt in everything so we're going to drain our capers and we're going to rinse them we're just going to let them sit for a sec okay so next thing I want you to get working on is your onion now I have a half an onion from making dinner last night. So I'm gonna use that, but what I wanna show you guys is, this is the part of the onion that comes out of the ground. The root part is the part that goes in the ground. So when your onion grows, it grows like this, right? You want to cut your onion top to bottom so that you're cutting through the root side. And then when you peel it back, it's gonna look like this. You wanna leave your root intact, right? Because if you leave the root intact, you're going to cry a lot less. So, Mom's on. hi, Mom. How's the picture look? Can you see the cutting board, Lynn? Yes. Okay, great. I like to take my onion. For those of you who've never diced an onion before, I'm going to give you a really quick primer on it. Okay. Put the flat side of the onion against the cutting board. Pull your hand back in a curve like this because you don't want to do this. Back. Do this. Take your knife, make it parallel to your cutting board. Okay? And you're going to go through your onion. And you're going to do it a couple times. The more times you go through, the smaller your dice is going to be. 
So mine are about a quarter of an inch. Then you're going to make your hand into a claw, go top to bottom on the end. Now when you sharpen your knives, and there's actually a tutorial on my YouTube page that we did with my friend Christine, it makes, the sharper your knife is, the less you're gonna cry to, okay? Again, with the claw, remember, keep your fingers away and go this way. Now, I like a really fine dice. Uh, some people like theirs a little chunkier. I really like a very fine dice because I want my onions to basically disappear into the sauce. I don't want there to be great big honking pieces of onion. Now, this is a really large onion. If yours is small, great. I mean, like I said, this is supposed to be whatever is shelf stable in your house. Um, Zach said they're actually called caper bushes, just FYI. Thank you, Zach, for that information. Because like I said, I don't know what they are. I just know that it's a flower, but and it's pickled and brined. And I love them. Now, there's also caper berries. Not the same thing. Caper berries are about the size of an olive. And amazing in Bloody Marys, but they're not the same thing. Okay, so just keep cutting your onion until you get almost to the root. And the closer you get to the root, the stronger it's going to become. And then just take this bit and pitch it up. Okay, the second thing we're going to do is we're going to get our garlic ready. Now, if you have been following along with me for a while, you know that I have one unitasker in my kitchen, and it's this. It's available for $12 on Amazon. I love it. I like it so much better than a garlic press. However, if you don't have this, you can finely mince your garlic. You can uh, run it through a, a garlic press. If you have a grater, you can grate it. It doesn't matter. Like I said, this recipe is infinitely rippable totally adaptable to whatever your skill set is or whatever you've got in your kitchen. I like garlic. Lynn likes garlic. It's just us chickens. I'm going to get a little wild with the garlic. Now you can add as much or as like <laughs> Lynn's clapping. You can add as much or as little as you want. Um, some people don't tolerate it well. Lynn and I are not in that uh, category. So yeah. to um, peel your garlic, there's a couple of different ways you can do it. There's a little tool like this, which is basically like a rubber sleeve. You can pop it in there and it peels the garlic and the force of your hand is gonna crush it a little, okay? You can do this and it pops right out, okay? Which is really the easiest way to do it. Looks not dirty anything that we don't have to you know, make more dishes, you know. So Nancy, am I going too fast for <laughs> you? I'm going slow. Now, you know, yeah, I went to culinary school. No, I didn't graduate. I just went because I wanted to be a better cook. And I wanted to be able to understand chefs when I was working with them. So I did that. Um... I never realized that I cooked quickly until I started doing these demos. So a couple of things to keep in mind. If you're working with a gas stove like I am, it is faster than an electric stove, and I will try to keep that in mind for all of you who are cooking on electric. And Nancy said, I started my onion before you did, so I'm with you. Good! <laughs> Great! That's awesome. Um, Damn knife skills are lacking. Well, the knife skills... It's practice. When I was in school, my poor husband ate more damn potatoes than he ever has in his entire life because potatoes are cheap. And I could practice cutting the dices and this and that and the other thing. And he ate gnocchi. He ate mashed potatoes. <laughs> you know, seriously. So now we're crushing up our garlic. Because this is going to move really quickly once we get it going. 
and everything goes in the pan. One, two, three. Boom, 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 boom. This is one of those meals that you can do in 30 minutes. So it's a great weeknight option. But, um, you know, we do these demos when Nancy is free and when I am free at the same time. And uh, she just so happens to be off today. And this is the first time in over a year that we have cooked together. Not that we haven't talked on the phone and I've walked her through recipes, but because of uh, my move from my big house to this adorable little downtown uh, restoration project, um, and Nancy getting a job working for Southwest Airlines, she's not always home on the weekends anymore. So that's why we have been on hiatus. So I'm really excited to be back here doing this with you again. So, all right, we've got our onions prepped. We've got our garlic prepped. I'm going to start with two cans of tomatoes. And if I think I need more, I brought a third can just in case. It depends on how saucy you want it. Um, my husband likes a lot of sauce. I like mine just to like coat the macaroni. I don't want a big gloppy mess, especially since I don't have any Italian bread to soak it up with. So we're going to open up our cans. And we're going to have them ready because like I said, this is like serious business. It goes really, really fast. Okay, got that. And uh, let's talk about our anchovies for a sec. I use an Italian brand of anchovies that are uh, in olive oil. Lynn and I both like anchovies, so I'm probably going to add more than you guys do. All right, so here's the thing. If you think you don't like anchovies, it's because it's been wrong for you, always. Tina, I like a lot of sauce, too. Tina likes a lot of sauce, too. <laughs> so, here's the thing about anchovies. Yes, they're fish. Yes, they're salty. But, if you take them, and I'm not going to do this, but if you take them and you drain them, and pat them dry or soak them in milk and then pat them dry. You're going to get a lot of the fishiness out. Now for this particular recipe, we want that fishy umami smack in the mouth because basically everything that's here is tomato, umami, anchovy, umami, garlic, umami. We want to get hit in the head with the umami because everything else is pretty simple, okay? Olives have a good amount of umami in it too, and if you're not familiar with that phrase, it's kind of like the fifth sense that brings everything together. Soy sauce has it, Worcestershire, <whistles> Worcestershire sauce has it, um, and anchovies and certain other you know ingredients that are not the star of the show, but kind of pull everything together. So I'm actually going to leave my anchovies as is. If you're afraid, pat them dry, get some of the oil off or soak them in milk and then pat them dry. These are not going to get added for a few minutes, so I'm going to give you time to do that. Now, anchovies are little fish. Their bones are usually still in them, but they're so fine, they literally disintegrate when they hit the heat. So you don't have to worry about like biting into a bone with anchovies. It's, it's not like a sardine. Uh, Nancy wants to know how many anchovies is too many. Well, depends on how much you like them. So for people who are a little timid about using anchovies in a dish, you might want to use two for this dish. Since Lynn and I like them, I'm using five. And just because I like it, and these are packed in oil, I'm actually going to use some of this oil in the dish rather than just straight up olive oil. So I'm going to be using a combination. Um, uh, Preeti Schatzman? I'm not familiar, but hi Preeti, thanks for joining us. Hi, I know it's important to pick good quality anchovies. So for those of us that don't know what kind to get, what are your favorites? That's a great question. Okay, so what's mostly available to the general public, if you're going into your Smiths or your Kroger or your Shop and Save or your Publix, they're going to be uh, Prince Edward, I think it is, in a little red box. And 
Those are fine, but they're not great. The brand that I'm using, I actually get it at an international market. It's Angostina Reca. They're from Italy. These are my favorites, but lately I've been having a really hard time finding them. So as a guideline, look for ones that are packed in a tin and that are in olive oil, not vegetable oil. Okay, I'm gonna, hang on. You know what, that's a great question. I'm gonna hit my pantry and show you a couple of things. Lynn, bear with me. All right. Okay. I'm not going anywhere. You're not going anywhere. Nancy got Sento. Yeah, Sento's great. Okay. So, I have... You have a couple. I, I like anchovies, okay? I got a lot of anchovies. Okay. So, these ones are, again, from Italy. It, I mean, it's like the whole thing is written in Italian. Okay? But again, it's in a little tin. These are the ones that's basically available to everybody in their major grocery store. These ones are actually sardines that are wrapped around capers. So these ones are really great for appetizers and things like that. It's not a great choice for this dish because we're going to add our capers. Now these ones, these ones are special. They're meatier. They're firmer. I like to just flat out eat these on a cracker with some cream cheese. But um, when they come in a jar like this, they're generally, I'm not going to say always, but they're generally better quality. They're more solid fillets like these ones that I get from the international market. So here's the thing. Just because the price is exorbitant doesn't mean that it's really good. If you don't like it, it doesn't matter how much it costs. So what I would suggest is go and buy a couple of different brands in little containers like this. Try them out. Find out which ones you like. Have it on a Caesar salad. Make this dish. Um, on, my rest, on my website, there's a recipe for a marinade that uses, for steak, that uses anchovies and garlic and olive oil and soy sauce. And it's really simple. Try them out. See which ones you like. Some are fishier than others. Some are saltier than others. Like I said, this is the brand that I like, uh, but it's not available everywhere. And that's the other thing. Depending on what part of the country you're in or what part of the world you're in, you're going to have access to different products than what I have access to or what my sister Nancy has access to in Florida. So play around. Your best bet is to not get those Crown Prince ones or those one of the... Don't get them. They're really salty. Um, they're really fishy. Um, they're great for some things, but if you are just starting out cooking with anchovies, it's not the best option. So go to an international market. Um, if you've got a great Italian deli nearby, sometimes they have a grocery section. That's a good choice. Look in the international aisle of your local grocery store. I know Publix has a good one. We have a pretty decent one here at the Kroger, uh, Kroger Smith's, which is Ralph's and um, what's the other one? Fries. They're all part of the same group. But keep in mind, what's in the grocery store is not going to be the same quality as what you're going to get in an international market, in an Italian market, or even in a Spanish market. Spanish anchovies are fantastic if you can find them. Okay, I hope that answered your question. It's probably gave you more information than you thought you needed. Okay, so now we've got the, the final ingredient. We've got our capers ready to go. We've got our onions and our garlic and our anchovies ready to go. Now we've got to work with the olives. So here's the thing about the olives. Olives are a polarizing ingredient in very much the same way that anchovies are. Either you love them, like me and like Lynn, or you hate them, like our friend Janet. She hates olives. Um, my son is not a big fan of olives, um, but he likes this dish. So if you hate olives, you can leave them out. And I gave you in the um, ingredient list you can use any kind of olives you want. So these are actually from the deli case at the local Kroger chain, which is Smith's, and they're a mixed olive in oil that's marinated. I just happened to have them in the refrigerator and the container was open. So rather than open another container of olives so I could have the green ones or just plain black ones, I'm going to use these. I think this dish is a waste of Picheline olives. I think it's a waste of Nisoise olives. This is like simple 
cheap olives. You don't need to get something super expensive. Blue cheese olives are not a great choice here, but if that's what you got, throw them in. So I hope you can see what I'm doing here. Actually, this one has blue cheese in it. I am cutting these into smaller pieces because we don't want a great big honking piece of olive when everything else in the dish is small, okay? So some of these olives are massive and I'm quartering them and some of these are smaller and I'm able to just cut them in half because you want them all to be about the same size. Now. When I tell you, Nancy wants to know how many. How much do you like olives? That's the answer. If you really like olives, put a lot of them in. If you just want a little bit of the briny flavor of them, just put a few. I'm going to put in about half a cup after they've been prepped. So she's using an egg slicer. You can totally use an egg slicer. Great option, Nancy. So what Nancy's doing, <laughs> oh, that's no answer. So what Nancy's doing is she's taking an egg slicer and she's putting her olive in there and she's slicing it that way. And you could totally do that too. But because I'm told that I cook too fast, I'm actually <laughs> doing it by hand because it takes more time. Okay. Then you like olives, right? Yeah. There's not much I don't. Hmm. I bet I could find something. <laughs> soft shell crab. Yo, yeah, Lynn doesn't like soft shell crab. <laughs> which is one of my favorite things. I love a great soft shell crab sandwich. With a nice spicy remoulade. And shredded lettuce, not leaf lettuce. So, um, I'm going to actually use all these olives because there's just a few of them left. But I did eat the one that had the blue cheese in it. Oh. <laughs> if I find another one, Lynn, I'll give it to you. Okay. But I think I, that was the only one. I mean, really, you're feeding me for free. I'm not going to be fussy. <laughs> yeah, Lynn is one of the least fussy eaters that I know. Um, so, now, if you cut up these olives and you find that, ooh, there's more than I really think I want in this dish, you could chop them really fine, add some garlic, uh, add some herbs, and you're going to end up with this really great tapenade, which is fantastic with goat cheese on crackers or on crostini. Okay. So. Oh, Lord. All right. I've got my olives. I've got all of my ingredients ready to go. Like I said, this dish comes together fast. So, cooks, start your engine. Put your large skillet, I told you to have a, a large skillet. Put it over medium high heat. And if your water is already boiling, just turn it down a little bit. Because we're not ready to drop that pasta yet. Zach says obviously pitted olives. Uh, yeah, it said so in the instructions. It said so in the instructions. Okay, so... If you have cooked with me before when we did the, um, the chicken piccata demo, you will remember that I told you capers taste best when they're rinsed and drained, drained and rinsed, and then we're going to open them up by heating them. So basically what's going to happen is once this skillet is hot, we're going to take our capers and we're going to put them in that dry, hot skillet. And what's going to happen is you'll watch them and they'll start to move like Mexican jumping beans, right? And the petals will start to open up a little bit. It releases more of the salt. It helps develop their flavor so you're not just getting a salty, briny bite in your mouth. You're getting actual caper flavor. Yes, Lynn, what are you chuckling about? Zach says, I don't read no damn instructions. Yeah, okay. He probably doesn't eat no stinking badges either. Okay. As Dan Burrell would say, riotous applause and we're just gonna move the pan around because we don't want them to burn remember this pan is dry there's no oil in there yet nancy says how high heat medium high which i said but you must have missed because you were so excited about using your egg slicer for y'all 
Now, an egg slicer is not a unitasker, as is witnessed. You can use an egg slicer for bananas, strawberries, olives, mushrooms. mushrooms. I mean, it's a great little tool to have. So, I don't know if you can see that. If you look at the bottom of my pan, you can kind of see there's like a residue. That's the salt burning off. Um, Zach, John isn't here. I'm, I'm the camera person. Yeah, John's not here, Zach. Lynn is standing in for John because he is on his way home from Chicago. So, just keep moving the pan because you don't want them to burn. Now, at this point, they should be starting to move about the pan a little bit on their own because the moisture is busting out of the flowers. And you don't want them to toast. You don't want them to get brown. You just want them to dry out and lose some of their brininess, if you will. It smells good. I know. Capers cooking smells amazing. And capers are really one of my favorite ingredients. And my husband has learned to love them as well. Nancy says no because I have electric. <laughs> okay, Nancy. I, you know... Sorry, Zach. What's Zach's problem now? He's watching, Lynn. You don't have to tell her everything I say. Oh, you know, I'm, I can't see. Because Lynn is reading the comments to me because I'm looking at the camera. I'm not looking at the computer. So if you don't want her to tell me, just say, don't tell Leanne but, and she'll chuckle on her own. Okay, your husband says, hi, honey. Lynn's doing a great job. <laughs> Shitty connection here at O'Hare, but I'm getting ready to board. Save me some leftovers. Okay, babe. Will do. Okay. So my capers are, I wish you could get up close. There's like really no way to do that. But mine are starting to do this in the pan, like rapidly. And that's about where I want to leave them. So basically, we're just going to take these and pour them into a separate container. You could do a dish, whatever dish you're going to be serving into, a bowl, doesn't matter. On your cutting board, it's fine. And I got a couple more still in there. We don't want to leave them in there because we don't want them to burn. Okay. Whoop. Uh, Julie the Hill just came up. Julie. Hi, Julie. Okay. And we're just going to leave those sit. It's going to be fine. Now, if you love capers, you can add as many as you want. I love them. This jar happened to be open, so I used the balance of the jar. All right. Now is where things start to move. Put a good glug of olive oil in your pan. I'm using about four tablespoons. And you want to get the bottom of the pan coated with it. Now, Nancy says mine are not dry. Shake your pan around and turn your heat up a little bit, maybe. Okay. I'm going to actually turn this off <laughs> and wait for Nancy to catch up. So here's the thing. Onions and garlic cook at two different speeds. Garlic cooks very quickly. Onions cook a lot slower. If you put your onions in the pan at the same time as the garlic, your garlic will burn before your onions are done. So what we're going to do here is, once Nancy catches up, we're going to put our onions into the olive oil. And like I said, I'm going to take some of this great oil from the anchovies, and I'm actually going to add this to the pan. Just because Lynn and I like anchovies. And John has found out that he actually likes them too when cooked properly. He was a very anti anchovy person. And he still doesn't want them on his pizza, by the way. But he likes them in other preparations. So what we're going to do here is put our onions in the pan first. And we're going to cook them about six minutes. So they're going to go from white to translucent to just barely getting golden around the edges. Okay? 
Then we're going to add in our anchovies. And we're going to let them sit in the oil and you're going to move it around with whatever you're cooking with. I'm cooking with a, a wooden spoon. You're going to move them around. You're going to watch them break apart and dissolve into the oil. Okay? You don't have to cut them up. You're just going to do it with the edge of your, your uh, cooking implement, whatever you're using. Then we're going to put the garlic in. And we're going to cook that garlic until you can really start to smell it. Yeah? Stir it around, stir it around, stir it around. And it's going to disappear too. The garlic's just going to start blending into the oil. Now, <clears throat> at this point, we're going to put our tomatoes in and we're going to let our tomatoes cook and we're going to let them warm up, okay? We're also going to add some Italian seasoning, which I have right here. Yes, yeah. Nancy says, I feel like I need a personal, personal consult. Oh, for God's sake. Okay. I don't know about the capers. Huh? She says, I don't know about the capers. Well, then, if you're just, just put them in the pan. Just get them out of your skillet, put them on the side, and let's move on. Because they're going to get added in at the end. Okay? So now I'm going to put my stove back on. For those of you who have been moving along with me, we're going to add our onion into the oil. Now, if you cooked your papers like I did and dry, uh, dry them out a little bit, you're going to have a residue in the bottom of the pan. Don't freak out. It's fine. As you add ingredients and you start moving them about the pan, it's going to pick that up. So what you've actually started creating is what's called a fond. And a fond is the basis of all sauces. doesn't matter what you're making. And you don't want to get rid of that stuff. You don't want to take it out of the pan. You want to leave it in the pan. Okay. Now, another great thing to know about this recipe is if you're vegetarian and feel like you need to add more protein, you can add cannellini beans to this. You can add great northern white beans to this. Um, for those of you who really want to get wild, you can add um, Italian canned tuna. Lynn and I are going to do it with just the anchovies. Okay, so my onions are softening up and they're starting to smell really great. Mm -hmm. And I'm scraping up the bottom of the pan. So all of that brown from the capers is getting incorporated into the onion. I like to do these cooking demos in real time. I find that when you watch somebody on television do a recipe, they do it through the magic of television. And all of a sudden, the onions are caramelized, and all of a sudden, the onions are chopped, and oh my God, here's the finished dish, all in 15 minutes. And that's not realistic. If you do your prep, again, of course, I'm taking my time, and I'm going slow, because for a lot of you, this is a brand new recipe. Once you've done this recipe once or twice, you can throw it together in 30 minutes, and that includes boiling your pasta. Okay, once we put the tomatoes into the pan, we're going to drop the pasta into the salted water. Because we want to let the tomatoes and all the other ingredients except the olives and capers, we want to let those flavors marry and meld and get happy together. Right? Then... We're going to end up taking our pasta straight from the water with the tongs and dropping it into the tomato sauce. And we're basically going to use the olives and the capers as kind of a garnish. Those are going to go in like right after we add the pasta. So my onions, I don't know if you guys can see them. My hands are a little slippery from the oil. <laughs> um, see how they're starting to get light golden? They're just a little bit yellow. That's about where we want them to add in the anchovies. No, Nancy, tomatoes haven't gone in yet. No, no, no. We're just talking about adding them later. Just the onions. Just the onions. That's the only thing we put in the pan so far. So now I'm going to add our anchovies. <clears throat> and we're going to use this to break them up so that the finished sauce is not going to have chunks of anchovy in. 
so that you know that. It, it's going to completely dissolve into the sauce. So for those of you that were nervous, Nancy was nervous about this recipe. She's like, I don't know if I like all those ingredients. I can trust me. Okay. So as you break apart your anchovies, continue to stir your onions. And you're going to see the onions actually take on like a brown tinge from the anchovies. So they're going to look a little like this. See? How they're getting a little brownish from the anchovies. shake my pan back and forth because it recenters the ingredients over the center of the pan, which is where the majority of the heat source is, instead of it all being pushed to the outside. And my anchovies are disintegrating slowly. Use your spoon, spatula, whatever it is that you're cooking with to break up the anchovies. They smell so good. And this really smells like heaven to me. That burst of oil, that fantastic caramelization, this, just the beginning of the caramelization of the onion and the anchovies, because like I love anchovies. And for those of you who are a little nervous about it, don't worry, your kitchen is not going to smell like fish. It's going to smell like tomatoes and garlic and other fabulous things. It smells like an Italian restaurant. It's going to smell like an Italian restaurant, that's right. And that's not a bad thing. That's not a bad thing. Okay, so at this point, I want you to see this. There's no pieces of anchovy left. It's all dissolved into the onions, okay? And now we're gonna add the garlic. Now I want you to lower your heat a little bit here, because garlic has a tendency to burn very quickly if you're not paying attention. My nose is just sorry. It means I'm either going to have a fight or kiss a fool. Sorry about that. Well, John is on his way home. John is on his way home. Now, if you think your pan looks a little dry, you can always add another little drip of olive oil. Sorry. Oh, look at this. I was so smart. I actually took salt out to put into the thing. Totally forgot that I did it. Because it's been a while since we cooked it. Oh, now that, that's starting to smell real good, isn't it, Len? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's talk about herbs. Now, if you're using fresh herbs, they go in at the end. Because the thing about fresh herbs versus dried is this. Fresh herbs, the more you cook them, the less taste they're going to have because they release their oils right away and then they should go straight in your mouth. So if you're using fresh basil, you should be chiffonading that while this is going on. And if you need me to teach you how to chiffonade, just tell Lynn and she'll let me know and I'll go grab some basil and I'll do it for you. Um, I'll show you what it looks like. We're going to be using dry because we're trying to use everything out of the pantry. Okay. So at this point, once we add our tomatoes, oh man, that smells good. I'm hungry now, damn it. Okay, let's get to work. We're going to add the tomatoes. And mine are kind of chunky. These are diced tomatoes, but if yours are chopped or crushed or pureed, whatever, it's fine. And I'm actually going to take a little bit of water and rinse out the can so I get every last bit of freaking tomato out of that. Right. So, you want to use the juice from the tomatoes to deglaze the pan. So what that means is anything that's stuck to the bottom of your pan, you want to use the liquid to loosen it and scrape it into your sauce. Okay? So this is what your sauce should look like now. I'm going to try to tilt it so you can see it. Can you see it, Lynn? 
Wait a second. Mm. Right, the delay. I know there's a delay. <laughs> yeah, you can kind of see. It. Okay, so it's it's not really deep in color. Um, it's kind of a light red as opposed to like tomato sauce red that you would use for lasagna or pasta or what have you. We're going to take a good solid tablespoon of dried herbs. Now here's the trick about working with dried herbs. When the herbs are dry, all of the oils get concentrated into the leaves. If you take the dried herbs, pour them in one hand and use your other hand like you would a mortar and pestle and run your hands in a circle, it's going to release all that smell, all that aroma, all those oils that are going to go right into your sauce. So, stir them in. <clears throat> and keep your, your temperature kind of medium here. I'm going to pop a lid on here so that I can let that kind of come up to a simmer a little bit and uh, start to really get the flavors to blend, which is what we want. So, I'm going to take a breather. I'm going to ask you, do you have any questions that I haven't answered? And that's good because Nancy just went, wait. <laughs> wait. <laughs> yeah, so I'm just oh. going to pause. What spice or herbs just went in? <clears throat> Excuse me. I used an Italian blend. So what's in this one, like you know when you go to the grocery store, um, you see Italian seasoning. Um, actually, you can't see mine. This is a blend of basil, oregano, marjoram, and something else. But it's basic Italian seasoning. If you don't have this, you could throw in oregano. You could throw in half oregano, half basil. You could throw in basil. Um, any combination thereof. Um, but I like, and these are all green leafy herbs. These are not any spices at all in here. So there's no pepper, there's no garlic. Uh, I know some Italian seasoning blends come with little pieces of onion and garlic. This one doesn't have that. This is just straight up herbs. So the difference between an herb and a spice, for those of you who have never heard me talk about this. How much? A good tablespoon, a good solid tablespoon about the, the size of the divot of your palm. That's about a tablespoon. Herbs are the green leafy part of a plant. So this is a basil that I'm rooting in the kitchen. Whoops, these are herbs. Spices are things that are hard. Cinnamon, nutmeg, uh, black pepper, uh, roots, seeds, barks, berries, those are all spices. If it's green and it's leafy, chances are it's an herb. So cilantro is a classic example of a plant that can be both. If you see cilantro either in the Asian market or in the uh, Hispanic market or even at your local grocery store, because it's really become common now. In an Asian market, it will sometimes be called Chinese parsley. Cilantro is an herb. It's green, it's leafy, it's fantastic for those of you who can enjoy it. I know there's a segment of population out there that it tastes like soap too, and I apologize. I'm sorry for you. But if you let the cilantro plant grow to produce seeds, those seeds are coriander. So you get both from one plant. That's not true with everything else, okay? Just coriander, cilantro are really interesting spices that are used worldwide in everything from Indian to Mexican to Chinese, and they'll use both parts. They'll use the coriander and the cilantro. In Indian cooking, they call it green coriander, meaning the leaves, and then coriander seed for the spice. All right, so now my sauce is bubbling lightly. We're just gonna take the lid off, and we're just gonna give it a quick stir. Oh, Lynn, can you smell it? Uh-huh, <laughs> yes, it smells great. Okay, it's bubbling lightly and we want to leave it like that. We're going to turn our pasta water back up because when you cook pasta, you want a rousing boil. You don't want it to simmer because when it simmers, the pasta sticks together, okay? 
Do not ever, and I repeat, ever put oil in your pasta water. Now, if you're making elbow macaroni for macaroni salad, yeah, you can go ahead and do it. But if you're going to make a hot pasta dish, never put oil in the water. Yes, your pasta will not stick together. That's great. But the problem is the sauce won't stick to the pasta either. And you don't want that. So, our pasta water is at a rousing boil. We're going to take, I'm using fettuccine in this case because this is what I had. You could use bucatini, linguine, spaghetti, capellini, anything, any string pasta works great with this. If you don't have a string pasta, penne works great. Rigatoni works really well. Ziti will be great in a pinch. You know, pretty much anything. Now, whatever the cooking directions say, I want you to cook it for two minutes less. We want it to be a little hard in the middle when we put it into the sauce because the sauce is going to help the pasta continue to cook. And this way you get pasta that is al dente and not mush. Claro, clear, crystal. I'm going to pour that in. This is where your tongs come into play. So we're going to use the tongs to push the pasta into the water. And we're also going to use this to pull them out. Because we want them coated with the pasta water when they go into the sauce. It's going to do a couple of things. One, it's going to add a little more body to the sauce. Two, you have one less thing to wash. Okay? Now some, like when you go into an Italian restaurant, they have these wonderful, I don't have one. It's one of the few kitchen tools I do not have. They have these wonderful baskets where they drop the pasta into it and then drop it in the water and then they pull it out. I have a noodle basket for ramen, but it's not big enough to do that. Nancy says almost ready to drop pasta. Great, Nancy. You are just, you're doing awesome. You're doing awesome. Awesomely, if I want to be proper English. If I want to be speaking proper English. So a, a, a tip that I, I was taught years ago is when you put the pasta in the water, don't just drop it in there and walk away. That's a surefire way to get it all stick together. You want to put it in there and you want to stir it until that water comes back to a boil. If you remember, every time you add something to a pot or a pan, the temperature drops because that's hot and this isn't. So... If you wait for the pasta, the pasta water to come back up to a boil, you're going to end up having a lot less sticking. So, we're talking about the fresh herbs. These just came off that plant that I was showing you guys earlier that I'm rooting. Okay, so to shift and nod anything, in this case basil or basil, if you're from England or Australia, you want to stack the leaves one on top of the other. You want to roll it up like you would a joint or a cigarette. So that it looks like a tube. And you're going to take your blade. This is probably not the best blade to use because it has anchovy oil on it. <laughs> or olive oil on it. Okay. You're going to take... And you're just going to cross... Cut crossways. Your mother asked, did you put oil in the water? Oh my God, Mom. We just covered this. <laughs> no, never. Unless you make a macaroni salad. Really? We just, yeah. I don't put it. You don't have to. Yeah. Okay. So now you'll see that this is all little ribbons, and that's what chiffonade means. So we'll just leave this to the side, and we'll use that as a garnish on our final dish. You might want to... Give your sauce a stir. Oh, give yourself a facial while you're at it. Open up those pores. And if you think your tomatoes are a little too chunky, just use your, um, your spoon to just break them up a little bit. Just kind of mash them down. Boy, have no questions. That means that must mean I'm doing a really great job of explaining shit. That's awesome. Okay. This looks really good. So, 
What we want to do is taste this for seasoning at this point. I think it needs a little bit more Italian seasoning. And believe it or not, I think it needs salt. But because the olives and the capers are salty, I am not going to add any. <laughs> because that's going to put another salt hit into the, into the dish. things that you could add to this if you wanted to. I didn't put it in the list, but oh, okay. I'll show you what we can add. Vodka? <laughs> no. Red wine. Because it's Italian, and why not? So there's I have, I have oil in my hands. Oh, get out. There we go. Um, I can't get the little. So I do want to tell you, um, and I'm putting in like a little more than a, a quarter of a cup. You want to let this cook because... Bring it to a boil. Because if you just add that in at the very last minute, all you're going to end up with is the taste of wine. And it's not going to be a cohesive anything. Great. All right. My macaroni is a little hard still. I get another minute on it. So the wine is going to add a couple of things. It's going to add a little bit of acidity. And if you are familiar with the book, salt, fat, acid, heat, or whatever the words, the order there, you have to have all four things to have it be great. So, but wine is optional. If you don't drink or you're afraid about cooking with wine because you're not familiar enough with it yet, leave it out. It's fine. We're just using up what's in the, in the kitchen, you know. We brought it to a boil, so the alcohol has all boiled out. And now we're going to add our pasta. And we're literally taking it straight out of the pan and putting it into the oven. Now, you may have noticed that the pasta that I was using is Ranzoni. Growing up in the East Coast, Prince and Ranzoni were the ones that we always had in my house. And out here on the West Coast, they're really hard to find. But I was able to find Ranzoni at the commissary, and I'm so happy. Barilla is fine. Uh, I, you know, I have nothing against it, but just for nostalgia's sake, I love Ranzoni. And if I could get Prince pasta, I would totally be all over that. Okay, turn your flame down on the sauce after you add in the pasta, and you're just gonna kind of stir it. And it's looking amazing. Okay, so now we're going to add our olives in. With my fuck em towel from Blue Q. Totally love that place. If you're not familiar with Blue Q, they have the cutest kitchen stuff, like, ever. <clears throat> How did you know the pasta was ready to move to the sauce? I didn't see a timer being set. You are a kitchen magician wizard. Who said that? Uh, Preeti. Okay. First of all, my last name is Nota Bartolo, and I've been cooking pasta since I'm 10 years old. Great question. Okay, so earlier in the thing, I said whatever your package said to 
to cook the pasta. If it says cook for 10 minutes, you're gonna do it for a couple minutes less. I could tell by looking at the pasta it was time. When I bit it and it was still hard in the middle, I knew it was the right time, okay? Because it's gonna to continue to cook in the sauce, okay? So, you know, whatever your pasta package said, if it said 10 minutes, you should be cooking it for eight. If it said 12 minutes, you should be cooking it for 10 and so forth and so on. Now, if you're using fresh pasta, you're dunking that in the hot water and then dunking it into the sauce because it's, pre it's already soft. But if you're using dry pasta like the putanas did, then you're, you know, gonna spend a little bit more time. Now we're gonna add in our capers. Nancy a minute ago said I need two minutes on the pasta. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. I'm going to stir in. Somebody's texting me and I don't, I, because I forgot to silence my phone. Um, you could hear the tone. But this looks really great and it smells even better. So here's the thing. My husband likes it saucy. My sister Tina said that she likes it saucy. This is perfect for me. Okay? That is perfect for me. Um, if you want a little extra sauce, you want your sauce to have a little bit more fluidity to it, you could take a measuring cup, take about a quarter to a half a cup of pasta water, and you can add that in. I just added a drip to, to, to illustrate how to do it. And stir it in there. Now, I like to stir from the bottom to make sure all that garlicky goodness gets up where it's supposed to be. Oh my God, Lynn, this is, it looks so good. Oh, it smells wonderful. Okay. Now I'm gonna use the same plate that I had the capers in. Um, some people will like try to get fancy and I'm not good at this, but I'll show you if you could practice if you want to. Um, so when you go to an Italian restaurant, especially these days, and if you've ever watched the movie Chef with John Favreau, you'll see him do this. You take your pasta, I suck at this guys, I'm so sorry, and you twirl it around a fork. Oh my God, I suck at this. and load it into the pan so it makes a swirl. Look. I'm gonna eat like a putana. Because the other way it takes too long. Well, not just that. I mean, I'm just not good at it. And frankly, these noodles are falling apart because they were dry for too long. Now I told you, you could garnish with cheese if you want to. If you're vegan, you don't want to, obviously. Um, and this recipe, like I said, infinitely riffable for people who are vegetarian or vegan or meat eaters. I am going to put Pecorino Romano on here. You could also use Parmesan, um, but I have this beautiful piece of Pecorino. So I am going to, mmm, gosh, mmm, love it. And we're just going to make a nice little pile of Pecorino on top. So, and Lynn, basil. I'm sorry, I'm going to start without you because I want to get the basil. I'm not going to forget the basil. I want to taste it first. Okay. I'm so glad I didn't put the extra salt in. The olives and the capers have salt. The pecorino has salt. Perfect. And now I'm going to make linen plate since my mouth was in that one already. But it's, I mean, it's that easy, you guys. I mean, everything came from the pantry. Nothing, you know, other than the onions and the garlic was fresh. And those are Make sure there's shelf stable at, at room temperature. What's that? Make sure there's plenty for John. Yeah, there's plenty of leftovers for John. You want pecorino on yours? Uh, yeah. Okay, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with pecorino versus parm, pecorino is sharper this is my opinion it's sharper um and it has more of a 
This is going to sound wrong, but it has like a soapiness to it. So there's so much going on that your mouth isn't sure which direction to go in with the, with the pecorino. Parmesan is just basically straight up salt, uh, which is great. I don't have a problem with Parmesan. Parmesan is the king of cheeses, but uh, pecorino has a little bit more nuance to it. It has a little bit more um, umami. It has, it's just slightly different. And because I have this beautiful piece of pecorino, I wanted to use it. Now, you should never, ever, ever, mm. ever. Mm. <laughs> Lynn's making that yummy sound. Uh, Ricky uh, wants to know, how do you store your cheese so it lasts longer? Okay, there's a lot of debate about this between home cooks and cheesemongers, and I wish our friend Diana Breyer was in on it. Um, so just let me back up. You should never, ever, ever buy grated cheese in a green tube in the shelf-stable aisle where they sell the pasta and the tomatoes. That's disgusting. And it will not melt. It's just not good for, like, anything. Okay? To store your cheeses, there's a number of things. And a lot of it's based on the cheese itself. So, cheese is a living thing. Uh, there's a great product out there called, for the life of me, I can't remember what it's called right now. But it's basically cheese wrap. And it promotes the proper moisture level inside the wrapping to keep your cheese correct. Now, pecorino and parm, I basically keep them in a big plastic tub. This is my, what I call my takeout Tupperware. And because they both tend to be oily, I put a paper towel on the end so that I can easily manage it. And I label it so I know which one's which because they kind of look the same. Yeah, you know, one is Nancy wants to know what happened to the red pepper flakes. Oh, sorry. The red pepper flakes were, thank you, Nancy. Lynn has a very um, tender palate. Red pepper flakes can go on at the end. They can go into your tomatoes so that it spices your, your thing. John will be adding his after the fact um, when he eats his. But Lynn has a very tender palate, so I left them out, and I apologize about that. But let's see. I think it's pretty good. Except you made me sound like a wuss. Well, <laughs> you kind of are. Now, for me personally, this is, this I is like delicious. salt. I like a lot of salt. This is finishing salt. It's maldon. It's got fancy shapes to the crystals. And what it's going to do is not just add a brininess and a saltiness to the dish. It's <laughs> Lynn wants them to. It adds a little bit of crunch because they don't dissolve into the sauce. This is so good. I'm glad you like it, Lynn. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Hi, Julie. Julie Vahil or Julie Kelly? Vahil. She said, hey. <laughs> mm. That is so good. Mm. So, here's the thing. I would love for all of you to take pictures of your food and post them on Good for Spooning or post them on Instagram and tag Good for Spooning so that we can all see them. Um, if you have questions, ask them in the event because I will answer them. I do go back and I do this, make sure I answer everybody's questions. But this video will be off of Facebook within a few hours. Um, It'll be transferred over to YouTube. Janet Shumsky says, looks delicious, and Julie Calloway says, hi. Hey, Janet. Janet and I went to high school together, and hey, Julie. Julie was my very first friend here in Las Vegas. I hope you both cooked along with, and if you didn't, that I inspired you to do that. Um, you know, cooking's not rocket science, you guys. It really isn't. You build a flavor ladder and move on from there. So our flavor ladder started with the capers and moved up. What was your YouTube again so I can follow you? Good for spooning. I will post it in the page once the video has been transferred over to YouTube so everybody can see it. Mmm, so good. Any more questions? Nancy, how's your dish? I'm waiting to hear back. I want a comment from either Nancy or Walter. Because she was really reluctant to try this. 
She wanted me to make something else. And I totally convinced her to try this. So I think the next time we get together, we're going to do something like crazy old school, like maybe chicken cordon bleu. Which is, you know, it was a staple back in the country club set when I was growing up. Nancy said trying it now. Okay, let's wait and see what Nancy says. Because she was a little reluctant. But I think we're going to go old school and try something like classic country club, you know, banquet menu from the 70s, chicken cordon bleu. We're going to make it more contemporary. I, I'm very reluctant. I know she is. She's like super reluctant to try this and I don't know why. Well, she shouldn't be. She shouldn't be. She oh, should trust yeah. me. Well. <laughs> when it comes to food. Yes. My friend Bobby was just here. And I said, trust me. He goes implicitly. Like when it comes to the food, he knows I'm not going to steal him wrong. I'm not going to make him eat garbage. Mm. So good. Mm. So has Nancy chimed in yet? Not yet. Apparently she's getting up. The Her mouth must be full. Which isn't necessarily a bad thing. <laughs> Lynn's doing this, reading the comments. Well, Nancy is. Because of my reading. Good glasses. Lord. How am I even seeing? I don't know. Well, I'm going to wait for Nancy to either call me and tell me how her dish was. Oh, no. Or text me and tell me how her dish was. And I'm going to let all of you go. Oh, wow. It's only been an hour. And I told you I'd be here for an hour and a half. L Linda Yee just came on and said, late to the party, but we'll watch it on YouTube. And we'll try it with my daughter. Your Great. kitchen looks incredible. Ah, thanks, Linda. Uh, if any of you need um, 31 products, Linda is a fantastic representative. We'll be happy to help you. Um, Nancy said, I should have cooked my pasta more. Okay, it's still a little hard for you. I would rather have my pasta undercooked than overcooked. Because mushy pasta is gross. But what do you think of the flavor, Nance? Hmm. I'm waiting for her to type. So while I have um, 20 minutes more for you, do you have questions about cooking for Thanksgiving? Do you have questions about shopping? Um, where to find great knives or great tools or Nancy whatever? Says, Nancy says, I don't hate it. <laughs> Told you. Told you you were going to like it. So if you've got questions about where to find great tools, now is a great time to ask. Pretty soon I'm going to be posting my... Um, Gift giving guide for the gift miss. Uh, a great gifts for you to give to the cook or the wannabe cook on your list. Um, or the wannabe, you know, the, the eater or the wannabe better eater on your list. I just found a great new um, organic home delivery service that, seriously, the produce was outrageously good. Nancy said I wouldn't go... As far to say I like it. <laughs> you like it and you're just trying to be contrary. I know how you are. Uh, Preeti says, I live in Las Vegas and there are tons of Asian markets. Mm -hmm. Any advice on where to get a good walk? I actually, if you go to my blog, a couple of years ago and I'll repost it for you. I, I ordered my walk from the walk shop in San Francisco. And it was incredibly reasonably priced. That's a black carbon steel one. It requires seasoning. With the shipping, it was under 35 bucks. Yeah, because she followed up with, and what I should get, too many options I can't pick. Oh no, so I have a round bottom wok, uh, and I have a wok insert for my stove. If you don't have that, a flat bottom wok is going to be a perfect choice for you, whether you have an electric stove or a gas stove, it doesn't matter. But I recommend the wok shop highly. Uh, the lady who owns it is ridiculously kind. I've actually stopped in when we've been up in San Francisco and visited with her. Um, she is incredibly knowledgeable and helps you pick, if you go to the store, she helps you pick out the right size lid, 
Like I told her, I have a 14 inch lock. I bought it from you. She said, this is the size lid you need. Uh, my lock is coming along. It takes a lifetime to season it. So don't be like too impatient about how it's not seasoning the way you think it should. It takes a long time, mm -hmm. like cast iron. It, you have to be patient. Um, but the wok shop, San Francisco, they're fantastic. Lindy Yee wants to know, what's the one kitchen gadget you can't live without? <sighs> I don't like the term gadget, first of all, because gadget means unitasker, and I've already discussed my only unitasker. Um, I like the word tool, and I cannot live without a sharp knife, period. End of conversation. You have to have a great knife. But if you want to know what my favorite gadget, it's this stupid $12 unitasker from, Casa, from uh, Amazon, and it mashes the garlic. This is like the only unitasker in my kitchen, and I freaking love it. Um, the other thing that I think is really great is this bench scraper, and it's from um, Marceline, uh, M-A-R-C-E-L-L-I-N. So th what this is great for is if you watched me do the olives, scrape that right into the pan. Pick stuff up right into the pan. But this one also has a beveled edge. So it's great for cutting up dough or separating things out on your cutting board. Uh, and I like the handle on this one. I think the, the wooden handle is really beautiful. Keep in mind, if it's got a wooden handle, you're going to wash it by hand. And I don't have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. I'd rather have something that's beautiful and is hand washed than something that's just okay. They can go in the dishwasher. But yeah, a bench scraper, I think, is an incredible tool that everybody should have for a number of reasons. But And this one runs about $10 or $12. Nancy says it's flavorful, mm -hmm. but I don't know if I'd make it again. Okay, fair enough, but you tried it. And just keep in mind, Nancy, the technique is easy enough. You can leave out the ingredients you don't like. So you could do this without capers and olives for a really quick, fresh sauce. And you could throw in shrimp and crush red pepper and do shrimp fra diablo, just like that. Bing, bang, boom. Mmm. Really good. Anybody else got questions? No, Preeti just says thank you. You're welcome. I will post the link to the workshop and the link to my blog in the, um, on my page after the event, and I will indicate which walk I have as well. And if Kim Foster is watching, Kim Foster is a uh, Jim Spirit Award winner. Uh, she lives here in Las Vegas locally. She's one for writing. She won for food writing. And she's the one who introduced me to the workshop. So thank you, Kim. What else? I got 15 minutes. Everybody's pretty quiet. Maybe their mouths are full. And if that's the case, I hope so. Oh. Kim just chimed in. Oh, Kim just chimed in. Shut up, Leanne. LOL. <laughs> no, Kim doesn't like it when I tell everybody she's a James Beard Award winner, but she is. But yeah, she is the one who uh, introduced me to the workshop. And she is also the moderator for our cookbook club called Please Send Noodles. If you're looking for us on Facebook, it has three exclamation points. And we cook from a cookbook as a group share our photos and our experiences and tips and tricks. You are certainly welcome to join, ask to join, please send noodles so that you can follow along with other cooks and not you do not have to live in Las Vegas to be a member. You can live anywhere. Um, but we do suggest that if you join your, if you join please send noodles that you support your local independently owned bookstore. So right here in Las Vegas, that would be the writer's block. They're right here in downtown Las Vegas. Okay, Alyssa says, I love seeing the cooking videos. Kim, what are you making for dinner on Thanksgiving? Kim Foster wants to know. I'm actually going Cajun this year. Uh, we always fry our turkey. Uh, so, And we'll be eating early because we've been very kindly invited to Kim's for later on in the afternoon. Um, so we are going to fry our turkey with Cajun injector marinade. I'm making classic dirty rice, uh, cornbread dressing, Broccoli, rice and cheese casserole, garlic mashed potatoes, uh, collard greens with uh, smoked pork hock in it. Gravy? Of course there's gravy. Okay. Don't be ridiculous. <laughs> My goblin. What do, you, what, do you, what do you think I am? A Philistine? Philistine? No, of course there will be gravy. And there, of course there will be charcuterie and cheese to start with. And we may or may not have a dessert. I mean, none of us really need it. 
Although I do have the pumpkin to make pumpkin pie. Um, Nancy says it's growing on me. I'm telling you, seriously. And Janet Shumsky said, I'm so glad I got to catch you cooking. You look so comfortable in the kitchen. Well, Janet, thanks for noticing. I have more than 1,000 live cooking demos under my belt. I have been doing this on and off since 1998. Um, I kind of sort of better be good at it. <laughs> but thanks for noticing. <laughs> so just tell the Food Network. <laughs> Go ahead, Lynn. What else we got? Um, whoops. Um, I have to go back. I hit the wrong button. You hit the wrong button? I hit okay. the wrong button. That's okay. Um, We're all amateurs here. I am. No, Kim just says gravy is the best. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so here's a little known fact about me. I don't like my food to touch each other. I don't want you mixing corn into my mashed potatoes. I don't want anything mixed in my mashed potatoes. I That was one of the hardest things I had to learn when I was in culinary school. Because I like to plate my food like this so that nothing touches. When you actually order from a restaurant, you'll notice that everything is in the middle of the plate and that it's kind of all touching. There's a reason for that. It keeps it all hot. Great. Only I don't like my food to touch. The only food that should touch every other food is gravy. Gravy should go on everything. Like, everything. Everything. Uh, Nancy says, love you. Great job. Love you, too. And wish I were actually sharing our meal together. Me, too. So, Nancy, now that you work for Southwest, you can fly out here and we can cook live in person together. Wouldn't that be a treat for all the viewers? But I seriously think the next time we do this, we're going to do something, like, totally freaking old school. Like, chicken Kiev or chicken cordon bleu. Well, chicken can you gotta refrigerate it. That's so old school. That's like super old school, yeah. Like, think about it, Lynn. No, I that know. was the height of fine dining was chicken well, cordon bleu when we were kids. I guess I'm thinking old school, meaning, you know, like comfort food. No, no, no. What, think about it, gang. When was the last time you had chicken cordon bleu? I can't remember. I loved it growing up. I cannot remember the last time I made it. But I do know the last time I made it, it was friggin' delicious. So I think that that might be what we do next time. Because it's super easy to do, and it looks way more complicated than it is. And it involves a lot of the skills that I've already taught you, like how to pound out a chicken breast. Um, <clears throat> Alyssa Ann says jello molds. Oh, God, no. I don't even with like... A lot of, with oh. a lot of laffy. Okay, so here's another little known fact about me. I don't like food that is congealed. I don't like aspic, I don't like jello, and I barely tolerate pudding. Okay, Nancy, up, up to the, uh, like if you cook together, mm -hmm. let's do something complicated when you can actually be there to fix my mistakes. Yeah, we could totally do that. Just get your ass out here. Because we tried to do it the last time I was in Florida, but it happened to be the weekend of her son, one of my favorite nephews, uh, baby shower. And that baby should be born like any minute because I think like the 14th was the due date. So I'm like waiting on tender hooks to see about this new baby. I'm waiting for Nancy to chime in and like call me and go, I got another new grandbaby. So what else we got? Is that it? Nothing yet. All right. So I am going to sign off and say thank you all for joining me and Lynn. I have to put my food down. <laughs> she has to put her food down. Thank you all for joining me and Lynn for our little cooking demo. Uh, of course, when we get ready to do the next one, and I'm sorry it's not as frequent as it used to be, but we have to work with Nancy's schedule, like I said earlier. Um, I will let all of you know Nancy, via the Facebook chat. Nancy did say, any freaking moment. The baby. I know, it's any freaking moment. I know, I'm like super excited about it. So I'm waiting for Nancy to call me and go, I get a new grandbaby. So have a great rest of your weekend. Please interact with me on Good for Spooning, on Facebook, on Instagram. <clears throat> Question me on the videos that are on YouTube. There's a whole quarantine kitchen playlist where you can go back and look at the things that we made during quarantine. There's also a cooking with friends list with my friend Honey Bouquet, with my friends from the Beer Freaks, with my friend Christine. We do a whole bunch of really fun things that are great for appetizers, <clears throat> great for entertaining, and really not complicated. The whole idea here is to teach you to make stuff that sounds way more complicated than it is. So, 
Have a great weekend. Enjoy. And let me know what you think about the recipe when you finally do make it. Thanks, everybody. Bye.